digital tools will also hopefully help in detecting these cancers earlier than what we are seeing today. I know that the, the whole space of the startups in the field of precision oncology is really booming. There are only three countries that have national programs for screening individual next generation sequencing technology. It's a very powerful tool. Hello, everyone. Welcome again to a new edition of Beyond the Cancer Diagnosis interview series. Uh, today, we'll have an interesting discussion about uh, precision oncology and uh, the outcome uh, from a psycho-oncology point of view with uh, Svetlana Nikic, the founder of, psycho of precision oncology uh, consultancy. Svetlana, welcome. And thank you for uh, thank accepting you. my invitation. Thank you, Adrian. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, as I always do, um, for the first question, I will ask you to make like an overview or to develop uh, this concept of precision oncology. And if this concept is uh, regarded like a positive outcome for the oncological patient. Yes, absolutely. So, so thank you. So, obviously, the term of precision oncology is fairly broad. Uh, before I give you my vision in terms of how I perceive that, I would just want to make a or disclaimer: I'm not a treating physician nor psycho oncologist. So, these are really my uh, personal views. I'm a, I'm a scientist. I'm a molecular biologist by by degree. It's so, even better. precision oncology. It, it's even better because. Uh... When you look out outside from the field, it, you see things differently that I see. So it's more important. Okay. Yes, 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 yes. So I have been working in the space of molecular diagnostic for a little bit under 20 years. And the way how I see precision oncology is really a field uh, that evolves around the patient, right? So that means uh, from the first moment when we... Uh, uh, identify a suspicious uh, uh, features in specific patients, right? Through the diagnosic, then through the treatment, treatment administration, follow-up. All of these aspects for me should be centered around the patient. So I see that sort of as a precision oncology uh, uh, definition. Um, in terms of the evolution that we've seen, right? We've seen huge progress in terms of, you know, identifying novel biomarkers that help us to identify patients who will benefit or not from these very effective and expensive treatments. Uh, but again, I also think that there's a lot of space for further improvements, right? We need to make sure that, that those solutions are scalable and that they not cause actually more inequalities, right? So we want more patients to benefit. And I always say, I would like to bring precision oncology closer to as many patients as possible. So I think there's a huge progress done so far, but again, we have also a lot of work ahead. Uh, and just a, a question from uh, what you said for all, our audience to understand, is precision oncology, let's say part of a personalized uh, cancer care? Yes. So I do believe that these things go hand in hand, personalized medicine, precision oncology, right? So today what is happening still in many institutions and many hospitals, right? Um, patients are treated in a, in a, uh, all patients are treated more or less in a standard way, are given treatment not necessarily based on the molecular profile of their tumor, right? So what we are seeing in certain places and for certain cancer patients that, you know, they get a molecular profiling of their tumor and based on these results, they are given a treatment that will be most effective in that context. So what I would like to see that we have many patients, hopefully eventually we will have each cancer patient uh, being uh, analyzed molecularly in addition to other methods before they administered the right therapy. Because uh -huh. there are many studies out there that have shown that patients who are treated based on molecular findings, so who are assigned these molecularly matched therapies, that their outcomes, so progression-free survival, overall survival, and 
ultimately also quality of life of these patients is better than when they're administered treatment based on, on, on non-molecularly matched findings. It is very important because um, uh, the COVID-19, as I always said, uh, put the society in front of uh, great and important decisions. And in uh, within oncology uh, field, especially for us, for psychologists, we notice that um, there are m many and many cases uh, which, as you mentioned, are not standard, like breast cancer or I don't know which one. They are more within the body, like viruses, bacteria. So it's a very, very <clears throat> difficult to, to, from the first symptom, to uh, do not have a gap till you have a diagnosis. And uh, we see on patients, uh, their decision-making or this process of what should I do, it's very difficult. I agree, I agree. But I do think this is a very kind of complex issue, right? Because we also, you know, it's a very subject, subjective on, on whether you're feeling fine or not. But what I do think that we will see, hopefully that change with all, all of these sort of AI based tool, all these wearable tools, watches, smart watches that we carry that are measuring our right um, specific features 24 hours a day. And I think in future we will see that, you know, through these wearables, we can potentially detect, detect some symptoms uh, that will hopefully, you know, suggest to us to see the, you know, the physician while we are officially still healthy, but maybe we have some symptoms that are suggesting there might be something wrong. So I think those sort of developments in the, you know, digital tools will also hopefully help in detecting these cancers earlier than what we are seeing today, right? Yeah, this is, uh, this is the most uh, uh, important thing because statistics, as I always said, show that uh, we are living longer generation by generation, but we are also exposed to higher risk and the risk to have cancer in your life, it's, it's getting higher as the life expectancy is increasing. So uh, it is a need in the future to be precise also uh, from uh, mm -hmm. precision oncology uh, to, to try to, to make a bridge on this gap from the symptom to the diagnosis and then to treatment. This is very important and we notice this on the patients because uh, they are, uh, they don't know what is happening with them between diagnosis and treatment. And it's very, very difficult to work with them because I don't, I don't know what he has. He knows, but he knows something. So we also need a specialist tools to increase our efficiency. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I know that the, the whole space of the startups in the field of precision oncology is really booming and there's a lot of exciting tools being developed. Um, and I think some of them will be really very, very helpful. So again, I'm not a specialized in digital health, but for example, I know that some of these tools who are helping patients to treat, to track their symptoms during the treatment, right, that will help us to sort of look into these patient reported outcomes, which are very relevant, you know, also for the, you know, drug approval processes where we can track what's the actual impact on the quality of life of that specific treatment. So I think these sort of tools will help both the patients to potentially identify some maybe adverse events, right? So the patients can go and see their nurse early on that they would have done without those tools. And then as well, I think treating physicians and nurses, they will benefit from these tools, right? They will help them to sort of identify some of those patients who potentially are not benefiting from a therapy or maybe are having some serious side effects. So if they act upon those sooner, the patient will not be affected as much. So I think these are areas that we will see a lot of uh, 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 development in over the few years, over the next years. 
And then also what we were mentioning earlier, right, about identifying these symptoms early. Also, there, there are obviously screening programs out there. And this is something I just wanted to mention in this context, right? For example, in the context of the colorectal cancers, obviously these are health individuals. But I believe in Europe today, if I'm not mistaken, there are only three countries that have national programs for screening individuals that are between, I think, 50 and 74 years old for potential uh, early symptoms of col colorectal cancer. And the uptake is fairly poor. It's around 20%. So, right? So I think we also need to do more in terms of education and awareness amongst the healthy population, right? What does the, what does the screening program mean? How does it, you know, happen? What does it involve? What are the benefits? We, I think within this community, we know what it means detecting stage one colorectal cancer and impact on your outcomes and what it means if it's stage three and four. But I think non-clinicians, non-scientists are not aware of this. So I think we need to do more in educating a uh, healthy uh, population. Uh, <clears throat> you are right because... Uh, our work is on healthy population, not on uh, uh, diagnosed, let's say, uh, population. Uh, unfortunately, in Europe, there are few countries with not uh, national programs on colorectal cancer, but with national programs on oncology. Uh, also in Romania, it was, I guess, last year that uh, was a national big plan for for oncology or cancer treatment but it's only on the paper so it's very very difficult also for us from the other part of, of uh, the problem to try to convince patients to make screening to uh, we try to educate them to uh, give them the, this psychosocial uh, education in oncology which is very very important for them but the feedback is not what we expect from the patient because yeah. our world today is very chaotic so they don't have time uh, when they are healthy they don't have time after the diagnosis they don't have time because they are ill so they want to make better soon so it's it's like a continuing uh, uh, running after uh, a diagnosis after an information so it, it, it is very important and you mentioned a lot of opportunities that this uh, field of precision oncology uh, show proved and uh, could uh, could help us uh, in the future but i would like to ask you about the challenges because it's a field within oncology and to uh, develop something in an oncology field is not an easy thing. So what are the challenges? Agree, agree. So there are many opportunities, as we said, and uh, equally, I would say there are also many challenges, right? So, so let me maybe mention just a few and then we can elaborate some of those. So uh, we were speaking about molecular testing, right? So identifying these predictive and prognostic biomarkers who can identify the patients who will respond or not for from specific therapies or who would fall in sort of a high risk group. So uh, many of these approaches require sort of a significant investment, right, in terms of infrastructure. So uh, next generation sequencing technology is very powerful tool, but to invest to 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 make this infrastructure available within a hospital poses a significant cost burden. So obviously, certain countries uh, with high income, they don't have uh, as big challenges as as low and mid income countries. So I think that's one of the challenges. But I, 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 you know, I know that the manufacturers of these technologies are also thinking about developing sort of alternative solutions, smaller instruments that potentially could deliver the similar results. So hopefully, you know, thinking about these different settings that we are facing across the globe, right? Low and mid-income countries and high-income countries. My worry is that, you know, whether precision oncology will make, you know, a bigger gap or smaller gap between, you know, these regions. 
um, another big challenge that we have, and even within Europe, so even if you just compare um, Eastern Europe and Central Europe, in terms of drug approval uh, times. So you probably know that once the drug is approved by EMA in Europe, right? Uh, typically, for example, it takes around 100 days for the same drug to be approved by the national uh, <clears throat> agency in Germany, whereas I believe in Romania is around 900 days. And low and mid-income countries, they don't even have that approval. So if you don't have access to the innovative drug, then you can also question whether you need it to be tested for an innovative biomarker if you cannot right, give access to this therapy to your patient. So my worry is you know, not to create more inequality. And uh, I think the time will tell, but I, I would like to, you know, and I know at the European level, there's certain efforts aimed towards standardizing and harmonizing these processes related to the drug approval and hopefully joint uh, uh, approval of the companion diagnostic test. So there are some efforts. The society is aware of these sort of misalignments. So the good thing is there are certain efforts that are working towards harmonizing that. But yes, so <clears throat> inequality and sort of that uh, market access issues are one of my biggest fears when we think about the future of the precision oncology. Inequalities, um, this is um, inequality, inequity in cancer care access, this is a uh, major issues. And not only from a precision oncology point of view, but also from access to cancer care or healthcare uh, system. And for, as you mentioned, low medium in income countries, it's very, very difficult because uh, <clears throat> the, pension, the patients are, uh, are increasing and there are no specialists. So it is uh, very important to, to educate both the specialists and the patients about every technology that could be in the advantage of the patient, because this is our purpose to, to help the patient. And in this regard, I want to ask you if are there any risks uh, for patient with regard to precision oncology? I don't know, uh, maybe they don't want to try this new uh, technology, uh, Maybe they are fear, uh, do not find out something more because uh, there is this right not to know. So it's not like so easy to, to convince a patient, a patient to, to do uh, such a thing. Yes, yes. So yeah, I think this is an interesting question. So we will probably also see, and, and there are already some data that show you differences in this perception among different nationalities, right? There are also cultural aspects. Certain nations are more sort of risk averse than others. Um, and and I agree, you know, when we speak about genomic testing, we think about what's, you know, somatic uh, aberrations that come, for example, you know, these are inherited mutations typically found in tumors, but then there's also this inherited part, right, that can give you predisposition to certain other diseases. And uh, we always speak about these variants of unknown significance that sometimes pop up when you do these genetic tests. And I think also there, there's a lot of discussion in the field, even between the uh, uh, clinicians, not to mention, mention the you know, non non scientifically savvy <clears throat> individuals, but I think as as long as everyone is you know very transparent uh, from the clinician's perspective, you know they have to describe what their rights are and what their duties are, right? And I know there are also some nationally national differences. You know, in certain in certain countries, I think you have to report on any incidental findings, whereas in others you don't. So I think there needs to be as well some alignment. But again, we are going back to the education, right? Um, predisposition to breast cancer, ovarian cancers, right? There are certain uh, preventive measures that you can do, right? Colorectal cancer. So for certain cancers, if we know we have a high predisposition and if there's a preventive solution out there, right? It's, it's a kind of a something that patients or potential future patients should know, but I don't think there's a sort of a simple answer to that question. I think these are sort of very ethical 
questions that we need as a society just to be aware of and address them. So, uh, to understand now, uh, you, your focus is on, let's say, big network of hospitals, public, private hospitals, and then hopefully in the future to go to local centers, local communities, because as you mentioned, education is very important, cultural background, it, it is uh, another important factor. And uh, I notice every day because it's sometimes it's very difficult also to talk with the patient. And uh, as I see the things, uh, <clears throat> we are going through very, um, let's say, digital uh, intervention, both medical and uh, I see in my field both uh, psycho-oncological intervention because we are talking in our field about uh, holograms, digital twins, so it, it will come the times when uh, patient will come, make the precision oncology and then just move into their room and have like a hologram and then you start thinking uh, where is the human touch? Uh, where is the meaning of life? So these are the questions in the future that we have to put because technology can't replace. Human touch can't replace emotion. So this is, I guess, another uh, challenge also for you, but for everyone involved in oncology. I agree. I, I would say it's a challenge and opportunity, right? So I do see, you know, the fact that we are moving into this, you know, digital era and thinking about elderly population, right? So hopefully, you know, once all of these digital tools become part of sort of a routine day for all of us, right? We will, you know, hopefully already be up to date with those developments, right? I think, for example, today's elderly generation is a little bit struggling because, right, you know, we've seen this emerge of digital tools within the last potentially 10, 15 years. But, you know, I do not see actually these digital tools replacing human touch in future. I see them really as a way to alleviate some of these, you know, administrative tasks from treating physicians, from nurses, and hopefully leaving more time for them to see and treat and talk to their cancer patients, right? So what is, you know, worrying me that, you know, there's certain predictions that by 2030 in Europe, I believe it's 44 million and globally 10 million health care workers that will be missing, right? Shortage of stuff or shortage of stuff. Very impressive numbers. So what I'm hoping that we will have these digital tools that will, right, alleviate this, you know, administrative tasks that will hopefully help clinicians to write up their notes after they've seen a patient that, you know, I see these tools more as a sort of a, uh, an, an, uh, a support, supportive tools for the treating clinicians, where treating clinicians can be really then, you know, dedicate their time to what they're best at, right? Patient, clinician interaction, giving the right treatment, and also maybe, you know, you know, having even more time for those patients, which today is really challenging. Yeah, <clears throat> you mentioned about the lack of uh, social worker, of personal. There are also nowadays lack of uh, psych oncologists everywhere, of clinician everywhere, because everyone uh, is going on the research part, which is, let's say, not easier, but uh, you don't have the contact with uh, the, the, the cancer patients. So let's say 60, 65% of them are going to research. And uh, in time, it is a huge gap. And uh, you mentioned the uh, age category uh, and uh, a lot of uh, digital instruments. Uh, I would like to ask like the final question. Um, how about adolescents and young adults? between 15, 39 years, there are generations that already use technologies since they were born. Uh, how, how are they uh, uh, receive this information in com uh, comparing with, I don't know, generations like 80s or maybe 70s? Yes. 
It's an interesting question. That's you know, I, I'll be honest. I didn't really give it a lot of thought. Uh, for sure, I would imagine that you know these individuals, younger individuals. I'm probably here referring mostly to angi adults, right? AIA patients. So I would imagine that, you know, when they are going to see their treating physician, they go very well informed, right? They probably know even better than I, you and I how to use these tools. So I would imagine that they would go very well prepared because they have access to all of these digital tools. They know how to use them. I would wonder, you know, from that psychological right perspective, you know, how do they cover those needs? Because there's this other sort of side, right? That, you know, maybe the digital tools, obviously they cannot provide them that psychological support that they need. So uh, maybe we will see in future, and again, I think this is really your expertise, maybe those younger uh, in the younger generations even though they're more informed they might actually require even more human touch right because initially they will be sort of so independent in finding those answers online and through these digital tools so uh, i i think it's going to be interesting to see how that group involves in terms of those needs and in terms of elderly obviously today i think it's a totally opposite situation right so uh <laughs> They are the ones who are benefiting mostly from this this type of psychological support. Um, so yeah, we're gonna probably see a, a, a lot of a shift over the next thirty to forty years. Okay. Sorry that I can't be more specific. No, it's it's okay. About this and it was very important because you you said that uh, they uh, they uh, this is true. They are very well prepared. You know, with smartwatches. I know the pulse. I know everything. Uh, the sleep uh, problems. Everything, but when it comes to talk about yeah to this to to express their emotion here is a problem and uh, even though i will i would like to to end the interview in a positive note i have to mention that as technologies advance and uh, as we go by uh, this thing of the right not to know uh, it's used more and more by many patients because uh, you start talking with them, not me as a psychologist, but uh, the doctors, and they say, okay, stop. I don't know to know further. So, and this stops everything. So, it's very difficult to work with uh, this kind of patients. So, this is even more important to make education, to make awareness and uh, to try to prevent and to try to, let's say, catch the cancer diagnosis as soon as we, we can. So uh, thank you very much, Tetrana, for uh, this interesting discussion, for joining me today. It was a really, really uh, interesting uh, debate about the future of oncology, which is <laughs> which is a very broad uh, subject and concept, and we'll see what future will bring us. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, good luck on uh, your activity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Adrian, and the rest of Onco Daily team. Thank you. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onco Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.